Rob. It's, it's a great privilege and an honor and a joy to be here. And there are many things that we're celebrating tonight, uh, but as you can see from your program, one of the main things that we're celebrating is Rob Desert. Uh, who, who, Robin, who is incredibly, uh, she's, she's brilliant, she's tireless, she's a real editor, she's an amazing publisher, but she's also uh, somebody who never blowed her own horn. And, um, and it, is, it is incredibly delicious to have a chance to put horn for Robin. So I, I, I just want to say a huge hurrah and thank you to Robin Desperate. Uh, we have a very nice evening in the store, beginning with the presentation of the Perkins Prize. 
then dinner will be served, and then the Flaherty Dunnan first novel prize after that. And all night long there will be the opportunity to bid on auction items ranging from vacations in Maine to vacations in Montauk, and everything in between. <laughs> um, thank you so much, though, for inviting me to be here tonight. Uh, as a first-time author, as Marie mentioned, I know that in terms of my uh, credibility in your world, I'm hardly Jonathan Franzen or Derek Jeter. So, <laughs> I really do appreciate being here. And it is a very exciting time to get involved in the world of publishing. There's such an impressive range of books coming out. And I know this is the Center for Fiction, but there are so many wonderful books coming out in nonfiction, just to pick one category, travel books. Uh, I'm impressed at the, the incredible explosion in the travel book industry, uh, specifically the many recent factual accounts of people's trips to heaven. Uh, <laughs> as you may know, the top-selling nonfiction book of 2013 is Proof of Heaven, a neuroscientist's journey into the afterlife. Meanwhile, Heaven is for Real has spent over three years on the New York Times nonfiction paperback bestseller list. Uh, it is a very exciting trend for that industry, and I'm sure we will all read more about it someday in Killing the Integrity of the Term Nonfiction by Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> by the way, I'm sorry if I was a few seconds late getting on stage. Cecily asked to make some changes to my jacket. <laughs> I'm glad we got this squared away. It's all going to be great. Uh, it has been a fascinating year in publishing and a great one. Alison Monroe was finally awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. Wonderful news. Wonderful news to all fans of fiction. It's a little bittersweet to a few, such as Philip Roth and the cast of Duck Dynasty. <laughs> E.L. James this year launched a successful Fifty Shades of Grey wine. Can you believe it started out as a Woodbridge fan wine? <laughs> and just last month, November, was National Novel Writing Month, and it was reported that over 42,000 novels were completed as a result. That is great news. I know if there's one thing that gets the people in this room excited, it's 42,000 unsolicited, unrepresented manuscripts written by first-timers in a big hurry. Uh, it's funny because I don't have to deal with it. Uh, again, we are here tonight in great part to honor Robin Desser, who truly is a great editor at a great company. Uh, just this past year, for example, Knopf published everything from The Circle, a brilliant takedown of the culture that feels compelled to put everything on Facebook, to Lean In, a celebration of one woman's successful quest to convince everyone to put everything on Facebook. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you again uh, for having me here. I, I will be up uh, periodically throughout the night again. I am J.K. Rowling, publishing as B.J. Novak. <laughs> tonight. In all seriousness, over the past year, working with Rob and I have come to deeply treasure her warm and bright spirit just as much as her wise and stylish insights. Now let me introduce someone who has had the good fortune of knowing her far longer than I to present the Perkins Award the Chairman of the Board for the Center of Fiction, Peter Ganay. Now, you can read in the program tonight a truly amazing array of comments from her authors about Robin and what a brilliant editor she is. I'm going to tell you a couple of things the authors don't know. Number one, 
Raman is an outstanding volleyball player. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you that the St. Martin's volleyball team was a force to be reckoned with on the court. Our battles with Crown and Harper Collins were worthy of a Norse saga. No one passed the ball more beautifully than Robin. We were devastated when she left us for Pantheon, which didn't even have a volleyball team. I still think she made a mistake there, but I suppose it worked out okay. Number two, it's sometimes easy to forget when writers as eloquent as Robin's describe her work that editing manuscripts is only a small part of what editors do. And in some ways, it's the simplest part. I don't mean it's trivial or easy, but it's just a sliver of what goes on in the publishing process. Most of the time, in the office, an editor is going to marketing meetings or talking to Binky on the phone, <laughs> or looking for the right jacket photo, or writing wheedling letters to blurbers, or schmoozing reviewers over lunch, or buttonholing the sales rep from the author's hometown, or trying to decipher the royalty statement. Actually, if we got it, that last one is impossible. <laughs> Not to mention facing down the bruisers from Harper Collins on the volleyball court. But the editor has to be the chief evangelist for each book, the quarterback of the publishing campaign, and the engineer who keeps the machinery of the house running. If you read the letters of Maxwell Perkins or any of his peers, you can see that Max spent just as much time on those tasks as he did in sculpting the manuscripts of Fitzgerald or Thomas Wolfe. That's why the Perkins Award is given to a person who discovers, nurtures, and champions fiction, not just one who edits fiction. And that's what makes Robin, like all the best editors, special. She has seen her titles all the way through the process, from a gleam in the writer's eye to the book on the reader's shelf, with passion and commitment. Uh, of course, what we think of as editing, that working with an author to help her work become the fullest expression of itself that it can be, is still irreducibly at the heart of that nurturing that editors do. And that's why we call on an author to present the Maxwell Perkins Award. Tonight, we're honored to have with us Edmund Danticat, who knows Robin from the author's side of the page. And we just on across many books, include Brother I'm Dying, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award and was a National Book Award finalist, Breath, Eyes, Memory, and Over Book Club Selection and a Colossal Bestseller, Crip Croc, a National Book Award finalist, The Farming of Bones, an American Book Award winner, and The Dewbreaker, a Peg Faulkner Award finalist and winner of the inaugural Story Prize. Born in Haiti, Ed Leach came to America as a girl and has become one of our most original and most fearless writers, exploring some of the darkest aspects of Haitian history and Western colonialism, while never losing sight of her character's humanity, rendering all of it in the most precise and lyrical language. Juno Diaz has called her the quintessential American writer, tackling the, world's hidden, the new world's hidden history of apocalypse and how one survives it. Her newest novel is Claire of the Sea Light, published in August of this year by, of course, Knopf. Please join me in welcoming Ed Greenstein. Good evening. Thank you so much for, to the Center for Fiction for honoring Robin and for all of you for coming. Robin, like most things I write, I can't help but wish that I could have given you these remarks to edit. <laughs> because I think you have figured out this rare and amazing thing, how to edit the heart. And I define editing by the way you have manifested it to those of us who are lucky enough to have had the great honor of working with you whether for one book, two, ten, whether for a year, five years, ten years, or in my case now, on and off for twenty years. Your editing feels a lot like polishing, obsessing at times, yes, but also cradling, nurturing, making something fuller, more singular, than initially imagined or even hoped for. 
I must admit that I was extremely honored when I was asked to present this award to you, but I was also terrified. But as soon as I got here and saw your name bigger than John Grisham's on this program, <laughs> And then when I realized that if I wanted people to cheer, all I had to say was Robin Desser. <laughs> but this is a very serious award, and you're a serious woman. And though Max, Maxwell Perkins was sometimes called the editor of Genius, it would be immodest to call you that, of course, since I'm one of yours. <laughs> though knowing you, I'm sure you'd rather have the focus shift from you to us, your authors, your rabbinistos or rabbinistas. I prefer to think of you, though, as the genius editor, especially given your occasional Einstein-like glasses and that hair, yes, that fabulous hair. But seriously, Robin's genius, and yes, I am indeed shifting points of view here, Robin. I'll get your notes later. <laughs> Robin's genius lies in many things, but what many people who work with her have cited over and over again is her kindness. I remember working with her on Brother I'm Dying, and um, I was writing that book. My father had just died, my uncle who had raised me, and I had a small baby. And I was writing the book because it was saving my life, and every note that I got from you acknowledged that. Among other things, Robin's genius also comes from her imagination, her empathy, her ability to look a step ahead, to see more clearly what we are trying to do, things we might want to leap off the page, things we might want to see shaded in a little more nuance. Robin is also precise, my goodness. If God, as they say, is in the details, then she or he must be Robin's best friend. <laughs> Because sometimes a note from Robin about the color of a dress or a character can open up a whole other portal in a story. Robin is famous among her authors for her editorial letters, all five, ten, sometimes fifteen pages of them. Her letters are so ingrained now in my psyche that when I read a book that I think could have been a little bit better, I think to myself, that book could have used the Desser treatment. <laughs> the Desser treatment, though, is not all about stats, for which she's also well known, or let's discuss. It is also about encouragement. Along with the very long letters you get from Robin, you get notes in the margins that say, love this, more please. Lacune, a word I didn't know until I met Robin. Though it might also be next to dig deeper than more love this, love this, love this. Part of Robin's genius is also making each and every one of her writers feel as though theirs is the most important book in the world, the only book she's working on at the moment. And aside from books, Robin's other passion is travel, and she'll travel to meet her authors. There are a lot of exquisite meals involved, but she'll also go to the occasional racetrack, too, as she has with Jane Smiley. She'll sit with us at award shows, holding our hands, and we'll feel all cocky, like, dude, I've already won. I'm holding Robin Desu's hand. <laughs> Robin, you are magic. Point of, shift the point of view again. You're our secret weapon. And though our names are on the covers of these books, I'll let you know another secret. Yours is also penciled in next to ours and angel ink. Feel full of carrying this great responsibility of presenting this award to you. I sought reinforcement. By the way, Chinomenda and Gozia Adichie thinks you have the coolest hair in the business, and A.S. Byatt really likes all the free books. <laughs> but this one particular author really captures the essence of what we feel about you. Funny enough, he's also an editor and a previous recipient of this award. So now you're also an editor's editor. So this from Jonathan Galassi, Roses for Robin. Robin, Robin, glamour queen, ruby lip and silver mane. When we meet you on the street, we are gobsmacked by your charm. Then comes the gathering alarm of those who may have failed their duty. Are the pages up to snuff? Are they worthy of the eyeball of such sovereign beauty? We read your long, well-seasoned screeds on everything our novel needs. 
awash in fear and indecision. Is this what you call revision? <laughs> Robin, thank you so much for nurturing our deepest thoughts, our silliest and weirdest too. Thank you for helping us dig deeper, for believing us in this amazing journey through words. It is my honor to present the Maxwell E. Perkins Award to Robin Desser, my editor and my friend. Thank you, Lorraine Tomasi, for everything you've done to orchestrate this evening. Peter, I thought I also had a really good serve, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I did. It's okay. I don't remember it. Um, anyway, this is the place where fiction reigns supreme, and uh, every year I come back from holiday thinking, you know, I, I need to do more nonfiction. I'm going to do more nonfiction this year. Every year it's just the fiction that, that I just love the most. I can't help it. Um, I can't express what an honor it is to be here getting this award and following in the footsteps of people that my whole career I have looked up to, not just as role models, but as giants, you know, whose, whose work I've admired for so long. Colleagues, Jerry Howard, Nancy Lees, Gary Fiske, John, Jonathan, yeah, now you're my brilliant author. Everybody look out for his novel. But <laughs> it's about publishing, and be careful your names might be in it. Um, Nan Graham and Binky, you are operatic goddesses. What can I say? It's amazing. I'm so honored to be in your company. Um, you know, as we were saying, you don't have a rule or guidebook about how to do this job. I mean, mostly you start up with bottom, you read and you read everything. You read things by people who are living, you read things by people who are dead. Um, you read this really fantastic, dazzlingly, great stuff, and then you read hilariously terrible stuff, and you <laughs> survive all of that. Um, and you make these comments to your authors that they tolerate, and um, they correct you, and they help you through that. And then they send you back something that just blows the hat right off of your head. And it is just, it's an incredible job to have. I'm just really lucky to have it. And you know, if you're lucky, you get to stay in the business and do this, and so many people don't even get to stay and do this, and, and I just feel so lucky to have had that experience. Um, I'm grateful to so many of you here, I love seeing so many of you here, and um, I have learned so much from so many people in this room who have supported my and our books. I mean, I'm looking around and I could just, basically what I should do, do is just list everybody who's here <laughs> and say thank you. Um, Sunny, I have to thank you most of all. Um, I will never forget last night at our Christmas party, he was saying, oh, I remember when you were a kid and uh, I interviewed you for this job and I remember that interview very well. Um, I remember I ran out actually that day 
uh, for the occasion of the interview to buy a pair of shoes. <laughs> so I was wearing these really terrible shoes, so I ran out and I bought this pair of fantastic Belgian loafers. <laughs> they were navy blue. I could barely afford them, but I thought the shoes are going to be important. And I was waiting outside his office, you know, and out from the smoke, the smoky and uh, he says, what are you doing, lurking? <laughs> anyway, you know, you hired me anyway, and I've been lurking around you for so many years, I'm learning so much from you. I am so grateful to you. You have set the highest bar for me in how to publish books and how to publish them with integrity, with style, with panache. You're an icon and a legend, and you're probably going to hate my saying this out loud in public, but you are just the most loving, loyal person to our authors at Knopf and to so many people who have worked for record numbers of years at Knopf because they want to stay working with you. Um, words really fail to do justice to Sunny, so I'll just say too, thank you, Sunny. Uh, it's been incredible fun working for you. Um, I also have to thank Marty Asher who um, at Vintage opened the door to me. And he showed me the wisdom of sort of doing things that don't really follow a business model and sometimes didn't even make sense, but that you should do them anyway. <laughs> and um, Marty showed me how good that can feel. Tony Chirico, I want to thank you also for supporting that same sense of instinct and serendipity and um, allowing editors to do crazy things. And you've also showed me how much creativity is actually involved in the financial and business side of things. And that, <laughs> it's true. He is so humble. But it's just so many of the things that actually really wind up supporting our authors have to do with grids that I cannot really understand. <laughs> but luckily, Tony does, and you know he keeps our place running. Um, I look out tonight and I see all of these people, uh, our literary agents, who Paul Bogart says likes to punish us for our successes. <laughs> but you know, you guys just keep sending us the books that we together fall in love with and we get to publish as part of this just incredible team effort. And you know, the authors are central to everything. And I really want to thank all of you authors who are here for coming. Susanna Kaysen just totally shocked me by coming here tonight. It was a total surprise. I didn't know you would come. And she sent me the manuscript of Girl Interrupted in letter envelopes, piece by piece. And my life changed. Arthur Golden, when you wrote Memoirs of Geisha and we published it, my life changed. So many of you who are up here, my life changed with working with you. And it isn't just, you know, you publish these books and sometimes they fail or they succeed in the marketplace, and you know sometimes you feel you don't have that much control over that. But you know you see what happens, and then you also know that so much of the long-term life of a book actually is going to happen after you're dead. You know you're not even going to be here to see which of these books are going to last. But while you're alive and here and working with people like the writers that I've had the incredible privilege to work with, you know it's an incredible experience. Um, the best thing of all about tonight, though, is that my dad is here. And, um, <laughs> I, wish, I wish that mom could be here tonight, and uh, we both know how strong she is. And she is the fiercest and best role model I had. And it was her idea that I entered this crazy business in the first place. Um, she was a librarian when she worked in after college. I had all these really terrible jobs that I hated. Um, I couldn't figure out what to do. And I don't know, where I grew up, books, they were just sort of there. I, it didn't occur to me that you could sort of do this for a living. And um, my mother was a librarian and she came home one day and she had torn out an ad from Library Journal. She said, Robbie, look, all you ever do is read. Why don't you answer this head and stop complaining? <laughs> so, because I actually at the time could type 100 words a minute, and in those days you had a typing test. So, luckily then I met Victoria Sternick, who is my publishing mother, and who is here tonight, and she hired me for my first job at St. Martin's Press 
where, as I already mentioned, I had a really great uh, volleyball serve. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I just think sometimes, you know, the love of fiction that we're here tonight to celebrate is kind of a collective madness. My parents uh, taught me that it was also just perfectly normal to sit at home in a room reading, even when it was nice out. <laughs> that if you locked yourself in the bathroom, crying over the ending of some novel, that you were okay, that you weren't insane, and that this was actually laudable thing to do. And you know, ultimately, it was my mother who told me that you could also make a living <laughs> thinking about this and doing this for a living. So. Um, who could have guessed it? I walk around Random House in this very tall building, and the thing I love the most is hearing the conversations of all these people, and everybody is just talking about some book that they're crazy about, they're obsessed with, all over the place, and you hear this, and, and I just, I never get tired of that. And um, I don't know, with people who read novels, you know, when I go on vacation, I'm sure this happens to so many of you, because all we ever do is read, you know, the my friends say to me, you know, I don't understand, since all you ever do is read, why is it that when you go on vacation, you say, all I want to do is read? <laughs> what is it with us that we have this, this problem, you know, this part of member of this insane cult? And I just hope to be a card-carrying member of this insane society and cult for as long as they will have me. And I am so honored and happy to be here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the